Good evening, everybody. Welcome, welcome. We're so happy to have such a great crowd. I see there's uh, many friends of Martin Gilmore in the in the audience and students. We're we're so happy to have you here at the Rupert Ratner Museum of Art. Um, I just wanted to say a quick hello. I am uh, Christine Ray Carter. I'm the uh, executive director of the Leaper Ratner Museum of Art. Um, and we are very excited to have this very special guest, a uh, longtime professor and artist, Barton Gilmore, as our guest speaker this evening, which is part of a lecture series that celebrates arts and education uh, that supports our current fall 2023 exhibitions um, the SPC Visual Arts Faculty Exhibition, which um, the series, this is the second talk in a series of seven lectures that we will be having this fall. And um, we're very excited to have Barton, who uh, this is his, I guess, sort of last hurrah with us here at the in his final year at St. Petersburg College. So we've had a very long long friendship with Barton as he has truly used the Leaper Ratner Museum of Art as his classroom, bringing his students here to explore photography collection. And um, he's been such a longtime dear friend. So we're gonna miss him very much when he eventually does retire, but we'll talk about that later. Um, before we begin, I just wanted to introduce our wonderful new curator, Sarah Felice, who is responsible for organizing the faculty show exhibition this year and organizing this gallery talk series. She'll give a little bit of an overview of Barton. And then after Barton's talk, we'll open it up for questions and answers. So welcome everybody, and I hope you enjoy the program. Thank you, Christine, and welcome everybody. It's wonderful to see you tonight, I'm surrounded by so many of Barton's friends and, and colleagues. Um, I do wanna say that as a curator, Barton Gilmore's work is first and foremost, very special to me and, and dear to me because before I started working in museums, my background is in photographic arts. So to be able to collaborate and work with an educator and artist of his caliber has been truly an honor. Um, I do wanna mention that while we have this talk happening and he is part of the faculty show this semester, uh, be on the lookout for his solo exhibition coming in fall of 2024. Uh, as we sort of bid him farewell um, on his retirement here from St. Petersburg College. Uh, I know that just from experience, an artist from his caliber, that doesn't mean he's going to stop making or producing. We just don't get to see him every day here at SBC, so we'll miss him, but um, really looking forward to working with him on this exhibition coming up. Uh, we've had a lot of wonderful conversations so far, just as collaborative creatives together. And, and I think that uh, we're gonna have a beautiful show coming this fall. So Barton Gilmore's career in art began by enrolling into photography classes at the University of South Florida in 1973. Upon receiving his bachelor's of arts in 1977 from USF, he moved back to South Florida and worked for a number of photographic businesses financially sustaining himself while maintaining his sights on returning to school one day to further his education in the arts. After working at Berkeley Film Corporation, American Express Division, the Art Institute of Fort Lauderdale, Color Lab of Florida, Dylan Reynolds Aerial Photography and freelancing for various clients, he returned to his alma mater in the fall of 1984 to pursue a graduate degree in photography. He received his MFA from USF in 1987. He has taught photography as art for over 35 years at various institutions, including Hillsborough Community College, International Academy of Design and Technology, and at the University of South Florida Division for Extended Studies. Currently, he's a full-time faculty lead professor in the photography department at St. Petersburg College, teaching on the Clearwater campus since 1991. Regarding his approach to education, he reflects, we are familiar with photography as a means for personal and creative expressionism, as well as its use as a tool for collecting and reporting ideas concerning all other human activity. More importantly, however, is its developmental potential, both artistically and personally. 
As an educator, teaching photography both as an art form and technical skill, instruction begins with enthusiasm for the subject and attentiveness towards students' maturation in art and the field of photography. Students have the opportunity to become visually literate, ut utilizing language process in the photographic medium. By encouraging students to observe how their experiences influence their perception in the direction of life, they begin to understand how to visually incorporate a sense of their own personal identity into their images. Recognizing the aesthetics of technological change and embracing the diversity of art, students have the ability to create images expressing and communicating their experience in relationship to the scheme of things in life. It is my absolute honor and pleasure to welcome Martin. Well, welcome, and thank you very much for coming tonight, and thanks goes out to the Lee Ratner Museum of Art for providing an opportunity for all of us to chat about this piece after I talk a little bit about the context of how this piece, Playground, came about through the influences of various artists in my career, and I'm also going to give you a little bit of a peek into the history of art and photography, because that has played an enormous role in my development as an artist and actually as a human being. It's not just art, it's about developing your personal awareness to the relationship you have with your art. So I'm gonna spend a few moments talking about the work, the influences, and then afterwards, I'll leave it up to the discussion. I'll just, we'll just chat about the piece, uh, about the production of Playground, now, this image up here right now is the photograph of Playground, the actual mixed media. You're gonna to have to go take a peek at it in the faculty show. So uh, I hope you do have a chance to get over there and wander. And, and if you'd like, I can even carry our discussion over there and talk further about that piece, Playground. I'd like to start off by, So the, the catalyst or the inspiration for this piece started many years ago. And I was observing my kids. I had two young kids playing in the playground, like most kids would play in the playground with other kids. And that really spawned me to look back, flash back to my days as a young child playing in my playground. So this is where it started. There's actually a sandbox. This was my ecosystem. There weren't any construction or any types of uh, monkey bars anywhere around the sandbox. This was in the back of an apartment complex in Chicago Heights back in 1959. And this is where my play area started. Now there was a, uh, a, a, a swing, and these images are not indicative to the exact area except for the sandbox. But a swing was added to the to the play area, followed by an eight-foot narrow go round, right? And then you have a single slide, if you, if you're old enough to remember these kind of things, and then a, a teeter totter, uh, and followed by a well the sandbox. But monkey bars um, followed afterwards very shortly. But what I learned about this play area, the sandbox, along with some other kids that were in that play area is that the toys that I played with, most of them broken, were hand-me-downs from my brother. And I learned to compartmentalize these toys into functional pieces of play art, in essence. You would call them transformers today. I would make my own toys out of the broken toys, and I'd even go around and, and pick up things off the ground, around the neighborhood, and bring them back to my little sand area and collaborate with those things I would find and make them new toys. And I actually, that was really critical. I didn't realize it at the time what I was doing, but I enjoyed doing that nevertheless. And, and actually the, the toys I made, you know, I, I recall foreshadowing a little bit here 
1986 and 87, when I was an intern and worked for Graphic Studio, the, the art research laboratory at USF, and I was able to collaborate with other artists that came there to visit. And we had to figure out how to make production side for what the artist's objective was. So we had to really think outside the box. We had to come up with ideas that the artists could work with. And we had to fundamentally work with things that we'd never done before. The artists have never done this. So this kind of played out in my graphic studio experience. Now, as we, as, as we went on here with this play area, and we lived there for until I was about six years old, uh, in actually Park Forest to be exact, near Chicago Heights, I did learn that through my compositing, and I have to kind of stop and, and like be honest with you, this is, when you all walked in here earlier today, I was already doing the math and compartmentalizing where you were going to sit, how many people were going to be on one side or the other. Before you got here, I was interested in how many seats that are in this area here. There's eight, there's 73 seats, excuse me, and how many pieces on the wall. I run numbers all the time in my head. I'm just doing, it's mental calisthenics. I do this habitually anyway, but I also learn how to do that in art. And I'm always compartmentalizing things out there, objects together up here. This is where my idea starts, right here. So I'm compositing my ideas together. And then later on in the production side of it, I'm putting that idea together. And that kind of started in, in that sandbox, right? So, so I'm doing this anyway. Now, one thing I have to tell you that, that a lot of people kind of bring this up to me that I plan too much. I'm always planning ahead. I'm a projectionist. I've done that all my life. I don't know why, but I've done that all my life. And a lot of my close friends, my, my, my family say, well, don't plan so much. <laughs> it took me almost three decades of my life to figure out to, to trust your intuition, to embrace it, to be spontaneous at times, allow accidents to happen. So that part of me happens in the production of my art. The idea is here. And once I have that idea, I know how to go about getting it. And then I allow that intuition to play out while I'm making the art. So I, I have to kind of learn and embrace that side. I would suggest any artist, or even if you're not an artist, not an artist, and I think actually personally, everybody's an artist somewhere in their life. But don't ignore your gut and your heart. Get out of here sometimes, right? Because up here can get in the way. Your mind can get in the way of your other centers. And I do pay attention to those centers much more now, my older years. Now, I can tell you that all this mental energy, and there's a lot of energy there, trust me. My doctor says that's a good habit to have at your age. You're always keeping the mind going. So I'm even I'm cognitive to that thought that I want to keep this going. Let me introduce you to Frederick Froebel here real quickly. Frederick Froebel was a child psychologist, developmental psychologist, who actually coined the word kindergarten in 1840. Now, this is important. This is when I, when I make a piece, I do research, and the and the playground piece that's we're here tonight for. The title of the piece came up before even the production started, so I like to do research on where does playground come from, and it actually comes from this gentleman. He developed a kindergarten in 1840. He eventually authored in the a free play time period for elementary kids in the curriculum in Manchester, England. And by 1859, playgrounds were in the curriculum. And they started off inside. They eventually led to go outside. And again, you're looking at pre around the early 19th or 20th century playgrounds. 
I mean, now these are playgrounds. Um, I can see why insurance was eventually came along here. Um, but, and I, I've had the opportunity to actually play with some of these contraptions, quite honestly. And I have been hurt on playgrounds too, right? So maybe everybody has. But uh, uh, Frobo thought that kids learning how to develop good manners and fair play during recess, that's what they were called when I was in elementary school in the 60s. It was recess. We had recess in the morning and in the afternoon for a half an hour. It was a fun period. I sometimes wonder what happened to recess today. It's still around, and I think the curriculum and schools are making an effort to bring that recess component back into education. Um, I think it's important. So by the time he passed away in 1852, but by the time the late 1859, playgrounds actually were uh, showing up everywhere, everywhere. And another component that Frobo introduced, which is really important today and still exists everywhere, are Frobo gifts. And Frobo gifts are the components, the materials that the particular class uses to enhance the development of their students. In our art classes right now, we have so many supplies, materials, equipment, a lot of computers that enhance that specific class to help students' success. So it continues to take. It really does. All the little tools in ceramics and painting in our photography classes, we have so many, we can check out equipment. I consider those frugal gifts. And this is an early, late 19th century image here inside, very contrived image. But these Frober gifts, this is where they went to. These are amusement parks. This is, I mean, now look at our play area now. These, this is our playground. Um, I mean, some people go to Vegas for their playground, right? Or they go to the beach, and there's a lot of toys you can bring to the beach or find there in pool areas. So there's, we're very mind conscious, at least Western society particularly, but in other countries too, that we're very mindful of play time. And, and that's very healthy. You need, to, you need to get away from work. You need to have some play activity. Well, playground, the word, the, the American heritage definition, one of the definitions is, as you can see, it's a field or sphere of unrestricted pleasurable activity originating from the mind. I could not agree more with that. I mean, that just made sense to me when I looked at this several years ago. I thought they were thinking what I was thinking because everything comes from here. Now, not all artists think like I do. For some reason, I thought that at one time, but it's actually every artist has a means of creating. And this made sense to me. Perfect sense. Now, I have to add that most artists, including myself, have a fun time making art. I enjoy it. It's playtime. And to give you a little bit of a peek ahead, the piece I made here is my play area. That's one of the original thoughts. This is when I can play away from the family, away from the stress, whatever it is, this is my playground making art. And it's necessary. I mean, it's necessary. Even when I'm not in a happy place, it's absolutely necessary. I need that nutrition. I need that alignment. It's like going to getting an adjustment somehow. I need to make art. If I don't, I don't want to think what's going to happen to me. I have to make it. Everything is in balance when I when I complete making art. So this kind of definition, I, I could not agree with it more. Now, let's, let's back up here. This composite word, um, it actually originated from the 14th century. In Latin, it means compose. But in the 19th century, photographers elevated that word because all they were doing was composite photography. Now, these are unknown artists, but anything up until about 1906, any photograph that you saw outside, 90% of them were composite made. 
which means that due to the limitations of technology, particularly the wet plate emotions, which were not sensitive to all wavelengths of light, would wash out the sky, This was problematic until 1906 when, when alchemist Vogel uh, from Germany developed panchromatic film, which was sensitive to all wavelengths of light. So any image that you see in the late 19th century or prior to 1906, most of those were composite images. That means that this guy here, Dustin LeGray here in 1857, or early, actually early 50, 1850s, he would take exposures of clouds and then combine them with landscapes or seascapes. So you'd have the whole image. Otherwise you'd have a washout sky. So you had to composite the images in order to have a complete photograph. That was mandatory in early photography. And most of these people, these artists, they're actually painters. Photography came out of the painters and mostly the painters were doing it for two reasons. One, they maybe were not selling a lot of their paintings or they were painting from the photographs they took. And again, LeGray here did a really good job. Now, this is really demanding um, to do this. And a lot of people didn't understand this, but it's despite being demanding, it had a single seam in the middle. So it was negotiable as far as working with the wet glass plates and combining them, layering them, and then exposing the light through that to make a contact sheet of the image on, in paper form. One of my early photography classes, and this would be probably in 19, oh, John, I'm going to say January of 75, I was introduced to the Oscar Rylander. And actually, Rylander, that name really rang a bell. And that was part of the reason why I named my son Ryland. But Oscar Ryland, uh, Rylander was a, a painter turned photography, very controversial artist, very ambitious artist. And this image here called Two Ways of Life, life is, is about two things here. One, the composite, there's only over 30 negatives here that he composed together. This, this was an undertaking, unbelievable. And I'm looking at this at the age of 19, and I'm wondering, well, I like photography, but this is phenomenal. How is he doing this? This was beyond my comprehension. I was still learning photography, let alone how do you composite negatives together? But the narr narration here is about this older gentleman, Sage, leading two young lads into the stage of life. And the two guys here, I have to decide between virtue and vice, whether debauchery and corruption, or do you need, need a purity and honesty life. So they have to decide. And that was actually a controversial narration, narrative in those in the 1850s. But the, the composite process was just, you know, how did he do this? And again, I'm learning this at the very young age. And I'm like, this, this was incredible. Another colleague of Oscar Rylander was Henry Peach Robinson. And he used six negatives here to compose this. This is fading away. This is the, the previous image was 1857. This is 1858. And this is about this young lady dying from consumption. Whatever the consumption is, is up to how your interpretation wants to be. Again, this is, I, I, I just really like this image. This is this incredible image. Uh, and you have to understand, it's very important that the concepts of photography really came from the painterly background. There was narrations and communicating an idea is really comes from painting in, in the 19th century. Now, one of the things that wasn't really connecting with other professionals, other artists, art critics, historians, even the public, except if you were part of the Victorian society, the Victorian society really loved morbid and melancholy subject matter. So that was an exception, but here's the key. 
people were not willing to accept truth and realism through the manipulation of composite photography. They didn't understand it. They didn't accept that process. And mainly, mainly because they didn't understand it. And I think that's human nature. When you don't understand something, you tend to pause, you tend to maybe back up a little bit, especially in the middle of the 19th century, when photography was only like 25, 28 years old. And now you're talking about red plates and composite. This is too much for the public to understand, way too much. And generally speaking, most people pushed this away, this idea of putting the images together. It just wasn't acceptable, period. If you wanted to tell truth, you had to do it the traditional way. Now, there was a guy, William Notman, who was a, a prominent portrait studio photographer in Montreal. And I really liked his work. Um, and these are all, now I'll talk about the other images of the seam of the landscape and the waters. These were composite images too, right? So, and he really developed a brand of doing these winter scenes. And he's, he's costuming the people, he's using backdrops, he's using props, the mood based on the light. This is a very elaborate process and it's a composite image, all of these are. And you gotta remember this, you couldn't just go outside, let alone in the winter months, but even in the summer months, you couldn't go out and just do those decisive moments. The technology was not there. You couldn't do real-time imagery that would have a spontaneous feel to it. It just didn't work. So these, these, these customers, they saw all to have something recreated. And he also collaborated with Yale and Harvard, similar to Oscar Ryland. And he, what he did is he, he did the seasonal where he'd go and shoot the various classes for those particular Ivy League schools and do composites of that class. This is the scientific class at Yale in, in 1872. And he took each person, it looks kind of like a drawing illustration, but it actually it's a photograph. He took each person and photographed them separately and then assembled them in a composite fashion. Really, I mean, it's incredible. I mean, and again, when I'm looking at this for the first time, I'm going, I was really, I was really enamored by this whole process. So of course, I had to try this. I learned very quickly, this was not my thing. Um, the image on the left is Alpha Tree and the image on the right is Stairs Beneath. Um, these are only two negatives for each image. And to me, it was, something was missing. The idea was not there because I work from an idea. And this was just, and I use the word just lightly, but it was assembling images without a purpose, only to appease my technical awareness of how to do multiple printing. So it was, it was absent. There was no heart to this. It was all production. It was whether or not I could do this or not. I like the images, but they're shallow to me. They don't really necessarily convey anything back to me. All they really do is they tell me that I can do this a little bit, but I really struggled with this. Um, I didn't have the patience. I really just didn't have the patience to do this. So I thought, well, this is not my cup of tea. And later on, I learned how to do it better, but I found a different approach to compositing and that went back to my thinking about the process. Now, Jerry Usman in the 60s, 1960s, foreshadowing really fast, another 100 years ahead here, this guy, um, uh, unbelievable uh, work. He developed the post-visualization method. He thought, and he, uh, he, he considered his darkroom a visual laboratory, his journey of discovery in his darkroom. And he had had enlargers in his, his darkroom in Gainesville, because he started the, basically the, really put the 
uh, the photography program on the map at UF, um, he would move his prints down from each enlarger to each negative and usually work three to six negatives. But I mean, seeing this work in the 1960s, in the 70s, this was very surreal. It was incredibly different. And I can only say today, when you looked at this work, most people go, oh, it's Photoshop. This was traditionally made. I mean, this is 50 years old. And to fathom what, what, what was like to view these images was just, you know, inspired so many photographers and artists. His, now, his post-visualization really rattled the photography family. The, uh, from Stieglitz to Weston to Ransom Allen's to Minor White and a bunch of other early 20th century photographers, the philosophy there, the manifesto was to pre-visualize your work. And Stieglitz always had the equivalent where you create images based on how you feel inside and you find that out in reality. And Ansel Adams had another way of saying it. You, you create images that are extracted from within rather than extracted from without. So, so this was a whole new paradigm to making art. And Jerry Usman thought that you can create images that have just as much impact after the camera shutter is pressed. You can do this afterwards. I totally agree. I just couldn't do it very well. And his teachings are still today. He just passed away a couple of years ago. I, I'm going to say like May 2nd, 21. But that was a big loss for photography. Um, but again, when people are introduced to Jerry Usman, who have never seen his work, it's really, this is not Photoshop. This is one of my favorite pieces, Floating Trees. Okay, so the latter part of the 19th century, realism and truth that began in painting now was hip deep in photography. I mean, studios were popping up everywhere. Europe, this country, people were more accepting of the composite process, whether it's done up here or in the production side of it. People were just more, this is, this is what it is, and this is how we're going to create images. And, and people were in droves going to studios who could afford this. Now, the interesting thing that was going on is that both the customer and the photographer authored these images. They collaborated together to say, this is what I want. The customer would come in and say, listen, I would like to, and I'm kind of improvising here as far as what they would say, but they would come in and go, okay, I, I want to recreate my experience, what I had, you know, last week or last month, whatever, can we do it? And through compositing, they would do that, right? So they would relive their experience. Again, they couldn't do it in real time, especially if you're out fishing on a boat, you're not going to be able to take photographs there, right? So, um, that's how it started. Then you had people come in and say, listen, I want to create an image about something I want to do. Or maybe I won't be able to ever do it, but I want to fantasize about doing it. So let's create this. It's bringing an imagination or an idea of experience into a reality here. And those, those, you know, Jerry Usman had a, a great saying back that he made in the late 60s. He said that photographers in, in post-visualization or even photographers that follow the pre-visualization uh, process, you're creating a reality that has more meaning than the one given to you in real time. And then guess what happens next? You have clients that are that are promoting a business and they come up well let's invent a reality a lifestyle that we can sell so they would create images to sell a product or sell a service right 
Here's your advertising today. What do we buy? We buy products and services, but most of the time we're buying a lifestyle that is out of our reach many times. We're buying into an idea, an imagination idea. And I always like to use the analogy when I, when I see that $60,000 or $50,000 SUV going over rocks and to the water and they're banging up the thing, I'm going, I'm not going to do that with my $60,000 SUV. But the idea that I could, if I had to, is what's selling that image. We dream of that. We fantasize about that, about so many things. It's what the you know, evocative power of photography is, selling an idea. And we buy into it, literally and figuratively. I was outside my 20th century art class, and this is in 1974, so it'll be 50 years in like three months. This came for my photography class because I had to take these prerequisites before I could take a photography class, fair enough. And I was playing a game of chess with a fellow friend waiting for that class to start. And I do play chess, not a lot nowadays, but I, that was the first game I learned in my life at six years old. My brother taught it to me. And I think that helped develop my planning because I'm always in chess, you got to strategize and plan ahead. And I think those were some of those components that, that helped my other conceptualizing of thinking ahead and compartmentalizing everything. But he, Brad Nichols walks by, and I didn't know him at the time. I didn't even know he's an art teacher, uh, his history teacher. And he said, you know that Marcel Duchamp was an excellent chess player. That's Marcel Duchamp. And I like the guy, the friend of mine, I kind of like looked up and went, who? Yeah, we, like the name sounded familiar, but it didn't really ring a bell. So immediately, I started scrolling through the book, my history book, when they had books. And, and before I got to Duchamp, I came across an image. And I paused. I was paralyzed by what I was looking at. It just... I felt like I was looking at how my brain worked. It's George Rock, the art of George Rock. I was just, um, there it is. It made perfect sense for me to see his art. I, 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 now, Marcel Duchamp, when I was actually putting this presentation together, I got off on the tangent because I do a lot of time exposures and Marcel Duchamp who radicalized Cubism and Futurism at the beginning of the 20th century and combined motion. I had to kind of backtrack a little bit and get back on track of compositing, but that's another discussion or another lecture. But seeing his work, um, I was, the fact that he could combine both geometry and perspective simultaneously was in line to how I thought and felt and, and just how I wanted to make my work. He became the beacon for me to follow. I fell for his work like no one else. I really, I just, I just gravitated to everything he did. Now, Picasso did similar work, but I think I liked Brock more just because he was the underdog. And that's another story, but both Picasso and Brock they had a way of taking uh, architectural structures and somehow reducing those components to cubes, right? And then through shading, they would create a flat and a dimensional image. I mean, it was just, I just, I, I could not stop looking at his work. Uh, this was pivotal in my development. I just like, I forgot about the shop real quickly. You know, I mean, I just was concentrating on him. Now, I did some pieces. Now, I have to stop here for a moment. It's not like I look at these artists and then go out and make these images. I don't do that. 
These images come years, decades later, in many cases. And the piece on the left is, is actually called Shattered Mirage. It's a very old piece. It's in black and white. Um, this came about quickly because um, I could spend a lot of time talking about each one, and I don't know whether I want to talk about each one, but it's, it came about because I was curious to know how many minutes or hours a day I spent in front of the mirror. Not, not looking at the rear view mirror in the car, looking at the ego side of yourself in the mirror. How much time do I spend there? Now, I think in, at the age of you know, roughly 19 and 20, I didn't spend a lot of time there, but I kind of got obsessed about that. I shed all of my decoration. If there's any jewelry I had on, which wasn't a lot anyway, I got rid of it. Any kind of um, um, uh, like um, um, particular clothes, I, I got, I didn't, you know, fashionable clothes. I wasn't interested in that. Um, the only thing fashionable I had was long hair. And I don't know why I even had that at the time, but um, I learned of that later on. But I did Shattered Mirage. I broke a bunch of mirrors and put them all together. And it's a time exposure. And that's what I came up with. The image in the middle that is the color piece here um, is called Emotional Strategy. And this is really about um, um, kind of getting upset, um, playing games, which I did play a lot of games growing up, games, not, we didn't have computer games in the 60s and 70s and really not too much in the 80s either. Um, but these are about board games. Now, something about board games, if you play them for very long, which I did, you have an aerial perspective about the surrounding board, your, your, your opponent, what they're doing, it's an aerial view. All board games have an aerial view because you're either sitting at a chair or sitting on the carpet and looking at the board. And the emotional side of it is that when I was putting this together, I got too stuck up here. I started planning this piece out too much. So I just threw it around. <laughs> And I said, heck with this, I just tossed the boards around. I did some minor adjustments, but I came up with this. Actually, I like the black and white rendition of this pretty much too, but um, it's called emotional strategy. Years later, this is another piece about, and I look at this piece when I, again, when I start getting overly conscientious about thinking about too much, what I'm trying to do. Briefly, this is at the Sun Dome, USF campus, and I made arrangements with facilities to go there and, and shoot inside their facilities for four hour, four hour block. I only had four hours. So I started using the surveyor's tape here. They, all these lines except for one are surveyor's tape. And the surveyor's tape came from the aerial photography that I did. I flew and did aerial photography from approximately 1979 to a little bit about 2004. And I did sur surveying from the air. So this influenced my perspective of looking from above. And I started using these the surveyor's tape and making a design, something from it. I just kind of had living here, right? But I had kind of a plan, you know, to make show depth and space and form and, and play off of the bleachers. And, and then the facilities came in because they had to change the venue from a, from a basketball game into a concert later on that night. So what was happening is that whole, the whole environment was changing before I could get anything done. So what I did, I got somebody to go up climb up really high up and push the shutter and I wrapped myself up in the surveyor's tape and I called this piece caught up in my own design okay because I got caught up in my planning to the point where I'm trapped so I just wrapped myself up and that's how the piece came about it involved both planning and then it had a little bit of a spontaneous intuition at the end there. And there was frustration on my part. 
And it wasn't until after the piece was done that I thought, I think this is going to work. I continued to follow Brock as he introduced mixed media and collage into his work, especially it coincided with the rise of Cubism in, in um, uh, 1905. Um, but again, the mixed media parts, I wasn't really connecting to. Quite honestly, I wasn't really connecting to mixed media. But this piece um, is an installation that I put together. And um, it's, it's, it's hard to understand a little bit based on, it's got a door, it's got a window. It's not big, it's about two, three feet tall, maybe two feet wide. Um, it's called Seeking Out. And I think at the time um, I was just uh, going through some changes and I felt like I was bleeding internally. I just, just, it was just something was seeping out of me. I don't know what it was. It was something, it was a transition period. This piece here is 480 feet on hold, 480 square feet on hold. And this is a play area I have in the backyard. It's, it's no longer there, but this was, this was a time when a lot of things were on hold. And I'm sure everybody's experienced that where we have to put some things on hold. Or if the way I look at it is I can't do A until B is done. And I can't do B until C and D is done. So everything is contingent on something else that leads up to that. So it's like a, it's like a mess. It's less, just like a, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, a conceptual mess of trying to get things done. So this is 480 feet square feet on the whole. And it's a mixed media base that uh, it has, there's other components to it, but that's another day, another time. I have to say that the Dadaism for me in that 20th century art class, and this is a class that keeps on giving. I mean, I, I, I'm probably more into the artists that that I learned in that class in the last 10 years than I was in the in the quarter that I took that class for in, in 1974. Um, the Dadaist movement, most of my teachers, even, even besides Margie Miller, who was my teacher for that class, most of the teachers, quite honestly, talked about the controversies or the arguments or the rivalries of critics dealers, other artists, about whether Dadaism was a movement, who started it, when did it start? It was always about the dialogue behind the artwork. It was just really, and I never got a good grasp on what Dadaism was about, though to its practitioners, it wasn't a movement. However, it did start in Zurich in 1915, and it really was comprised of artists, or actually refugee artists and intellectuals from various capitals in Europe that were that beset by World War I. These were artists that were hijacked out of their native country because of the war. And I particularly liked the work of Kurt Switters. Now, Kurt Switters, a German artist, um, what range did he have? I mean, this guy, I mean, he was a painter. He was a sculpturist. He was a graphic designer. He was an installational artist. He was a poet. He also was associated with movements of surrealism, constructivism, and cubism. And he actually introduced collage or abstraction, excuse me, to collage. So he, the range was incredible. But when you look at the pieces that he did, now, again, when I first looked at this work, I didn't really get it. I get it now. The dismantling of, of fragments of destruction from the war, a lot of the artists had to assemble things just from pieces. That was what drove them. They put things together. The found object actually started from data. The photomontage started from data. But when you look at how these artists had to respond because their livelihoods were disrupted and the pieces that they created because of 
what they have to work with, it makes perfect sense. And Kurt's work really, you know, I understand it now. I think it's probably been maybe the last 10 years because I go back and look at these artists. I teach understanding in art and I'm always looking at artists now and they have such more of a profound meaning to me than they did 40, 50 years ago. And they, it keeps on elevating. It keeps up, it, it ups my game. It makes me try harder. This is a piece titled Personal Space. And it is a mixed media piece, acrylic painted. And what this piece taught me is I actually contrived a piece. I'm always contriving in the studio, the space I used to, when I shot this piece now, my daughter owns that bedroom. And I moved to another bedroom and started doing that. My son now owns that bedroom. So now I'm kind of been, I'm a refugee out in the, my garage working there or wherever I can find a location in my house. That's where I'm working. So, but this piece, I did a piece and I'm like, okay, I like it. And in the process of dismantling the piece, right? Picking all this stuff up, it was just a bunch of stuff. I stopped and said, that's the piece that I was destined for. This is the piece that surpassed my contrived piece. And this was just through the dismantling of the piece that originally I was working on. It was picking up the stuff and putting it in the pile. I was gonna throw all this out. And before me, that is what I saw. And I thought, okay, I like this. So that's just, you know, your process of making art just doesn't start from the get-go. It starts from the ending of it as well. You'd never give up looking at where something, a fragment of your creativity is going to grow from. And this, so this came from the downside of it or the picking up my stuff. It never stops. You got to keep on looking. You got to keep on having faith in your process. Even when it doesn't feel right, something's going to come out of it. it. It always does. It always does. I think one of the um, movements that really caught my ear, and I meant ear, was the Futurist movement. The name itself was so attract attracted to me. I didn't know anything about the Futurist movement when I heard this in the 20th century class, but I like the name. I mean, here I'm 19 years old. Actually, so I was 18 years old at this time. And, and I mean, you're young, you have the whole future. It's just, it really resonated with me. This future, it's gotta be really phenomenal work, right? I was kind of actually disappointed with the work because I didn't understand it. Again, it's about not really being mature or understanding or knowing the depth of artists, but I did really follow Joseph Stella. And before I talk briefly about him, I wanna say that, you know, the futures movement I mean, I mean the, the manifesto um, it was written by um, Marinetti, an Italian poet in, in uh, I want to say 1909. And he came up with this idea where you take all the known things in the world, the ideas, the, the buildings, the institutions, everything. You tear them down and you rebuild something new in its place. That was the kind of the manifesto of the future's idea. That's what they did. And, and they celebrated machines, speed, buildings, violence, and youth. And when I learned that, I'm going, really? I mean, you know, I like the name, but I'm not sure if I'm on board with everything. And when I first saw these images, I'm like, eh, okay, okay, I get it. I mean, this is factories. Now, Joseph Stella pioneered futurism in the United States in 1919. And he was interested in the Industrial Revolution in New York, right? In Brooklyn, he settled in Brooklyn. And all the lights and the commotion and speed and new things being built, machines, um, this really appealed to him. Um, and he really 
fell in love with the Brooklyn Bridge. Okay, this was the, the pinnacle of his work. He did a lot of renditions of this because there, there was zigzag lines, there was perspective, depth into space, a lot of energy. Um, so he kind of, he felt like this piece, the Brooklyn Bridge in itself was kind of a, a shrine to America's efforts, to the civilization of America's efforts for a new country. It was mixing old with new. And he felt like this was indicative to American life. And this piece, and a lot of artists actually painted this. I think he probably painted the most or the most successful paintings that I liked. Now, these pieces by me, um, I wasn't thinking of Joseph Stella when I did this work. Most, I would say all the work I'm showing in my personal work, I wasn't thinking of the, who was the artist that did, who I followed maybe. I kind of look at it as this a post thought process. The image on the left is called growth patterns. And I observe in myself and even other people, we go through growth patterns. And, and I think it's important to observe those growth patterns because they tend to repeat themselves many times in our lives. We are wishful thinking that we don't do the same mistakes over again. And we've learned from the first mistake. And I don't believe in mistakes personally or accidents. I think it's just another process of life and we learn from them, right? Failing at anything is actually healthy. Okay, I've always kind of believed in that. So I've learned so much more about what doesn't work than what does work. I mean, there's a fine balance there. I think as you get older, you tend to like, you go with a, a solid philosophy. But growth patterns about was, was about observing something that I've experienced before and something I grew from. And the piece on the left, the long version of is the lo losing ends of feelings. I call it loose ends because at the time there were a lot of loose ends in my life. And, um, and I didn't know how I was gonna tackle all of them. Some of them went away just naturally and some of them I dressed. Again, having faith that you get through this, everything's gonna be fine. Um, to give you a perspective, at the bottom left-hand corner is my foot. Uh, the tennis shoe is my foot. The bottom left-hand corner of the piece on the right, the bottom left-hand corner is a foot. The main black post is a tripod leg. Just to kind of give you some, an idea of what space you're looking at. Minor White, an educator, a critic, a theorist. You've got Aaron Siskin, who was um, a photographer, part of the abstract expressionist movement. You have Oscar Bailey, who is the uh, originator for the photography program at USF in 1969. I'm a photographer um, and one of my first teachers at USF. These were all, they were part of the formalist movement and formalism really dealt with, with object portrayal, if that makes sense, where they concentrated on styles, communicating styles and emotions, rather than concentrating on the principal theme that the object represents, if that is clear. They were containing on, on, on objects, portrayal. Now, I stem from the formalism genre. That was my foundation. I still rely on that. Um, the piece on the left is chairs and house, and the piece on the right, oops, the piece on that, that's called exit, and that is house and chairs. It's about design, and for me, it's I just felt good about it. I wasn't trying to communicate an idea. These pieces, the title came afterwards. Usually in my formalistic approach, the title is not there. It just, re I'm a reactionary. Probably the work by David Hockney 
is probably the closest resemblance of the Pace Playhouse in the show, faculty show, due to his organic approach and working the way he's arranged his images to kind of extend the boundaries, the traditional boundaries of what a photograph is. David Hockney was a painter, but he worked in photo montage from 1970 to 1982. And he did this kind of work. I really actually enjoyed his work quite a bit. I was like, whoa, this is good stuff. Now, the way he called these joiners, J-O-I-N-E-R-S, that was the technique that he called his photo montage. And it was his dislike in the distortion of wide angle lenses and their one eye point of view rather than showing time and narration. And he just didn't like the wide angle. So he created these joiners, his technique. And I think probably these images, when we look at the, again, the playground here, will probably, you know, be very similar. But again, I wasn't thinking of David Hockney whatsoever when I was doing playground. I was just, it was something that I'm sure had a, an underlining impact on the creation of playground. The last image I have to share with you, the final image here, is, is uh, you could probably attest to many people in your life that you ask yourself, how did I get to this location? How did I get here? How am I, why am I standing here tonight? And there's a few people I can thank that I'm here, why I'm here tonight talking to you. There's one person that probably had the most profound impact why I'm teaching as an educator. And that is this lady, a colleague, a friend, an educator, my first photo teacher, Suzanne Camp Crosby. If it wasn't for her, I would not be here. And she's actually, the students I teach today in my classes, she's there with me, delivering information in the same method, many ways the same method that she did. So she's the reason why I'm here tonight. And I thank you very much. And I can leave this now open to any questions that you may have. Oh, thank you. Yes. So I know nothing about the So I was wondering if you have some simplistic description of the process. So the production side of this, yeah, I can tell exactly. I mean, it's um, a great question. Um, I started off with 14 pieces of 100% rag, eight and a half, 11 typing paper, 14 pieces. And I taped them all together, just blank pieces of paper, taped them in that design without anything on it. And then I painted the paper with spray paint, acrylic. I painted it. I used polyurethane on top of that. And then I sewed in a lot of material into this piece and then added various components on top of that. I knew from the very get-go that this was gonna be playground. And playgrounds today, if you look at them, they're very colorful. They, they make them to be safe now. Safety is the number one thing. They're made out of plastic and have cushioned floors and grass and all that. So I was trying to be very light and fun with this piece, but I did not abandon the fact that I'm making this piece and I'm having a playtime too. It's not all about just the rendition of, of a playground play area where I saw my kids play and I still see them play in various things and different components. They've raised the game a little bit now. Now they're at, you know, Flying Squirrel, which is a trampoline place, and they, they're doing other things. But it really came from the core of, it's my play area. I have fun. This is my playground. Making art is my playground. It's always been. But this is the, the epitome. This is where it finally came out. It finally gave itself up and said, yes, we have a relationship here. 
the piece of art and me, you know, we have to work together here because I, I talk to my piece all the time. A lot of times not verbally outside, but I'm communicating with it internally. And then occasionally, I don't know if anybody had a chance to read my little description about it, but, you know, I reference on many levels in my, my kind of poem or whatever you want to call it. There's a lot of components there that talk about the experience of the playground, but there's a lot of components there that talk about my kids coming in while I'm working on my art. And that changes everything. When I'm working on my art, my son, Rylan, or Raina will come in and, and want to see what I'm doing. And that's the spot, spontaneity or the intuition that kind of, those things are unpredictable. Sometimes I like their presence and that changes the whole production very quickly. It changes everything. And sometimes I don't like them being there, to be honest with you. I'm like, oh, gee, I just, you know, but I gotta, I gotta step back and go, okay, it's okay. So the, the question again is the materials are put together, painted, a lot of stitching, I went into that. I love, I love sewing. And that's, uh, that's a derivative for my mom. She was a, a seamstress. So I've really, the last 10, 15 years, started adding a lot of sewing into my work. It slows me down, you know, because I'm always running and it slows me down a little bit at a better pace to take it all in and to come up with new ideas in real time. Does that help? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. More questions on anything about the piece, about what I just shared with you? So you gave a really wonderful overarching background of photo history, which I you were bringing back in memory. I was actually surprised to not hear you touch on Van Ray at all in that in that conversation. And so it, it was that deliberate, do you feel that his work sort of because I mean being part of Dada is as well. Was it intentional to leave out of that conversation? I intentionally left a lot of people out. Okay. And I had 300 slides originally oh, for this. I uh, certainly 300. And, I, uh, and this is only what I think 59 I showed with okay. me. So um, I actually left quite a few people out. And uh, Man Ray probably, I mean, probably had more impact than maybe even uh, Kurt Schwitters. Man Ray was more of a love. When I first learned of him, and I was oversaturated with him, so Kurt kind of came as a as a latent, and I kind of my mixed media stuff I think resembles now more Kurt's than Man Ray's, in right. my opinion. Yeah. But um, I I've been familiar with Man Ray for a lot, and mainly photography. He was, but I I kind of like got burned out sure. a little yeah. bit on him, but there's there's a lot of others on like I, I can tell you about the, the MC Escher has influenced me a lot, not so much more in the commercial side, but the strategic, he's a chess player as well, a brilliant mathematician, Leibniz Einstein, but th there's a lot of artists that I really wanted to kind of go into and like, but you know, Man Ray was always there and, and he was, spoke highly in the photography classes and it got to the point where, okay, who else is out there? Who am I ignoring because I'm being so dominant this guy's dominating me. So it's kind of like, it's, you know, I found myself, okay, I'm, I'm enough of Man Ray, who else is out there? But it's, it's a good question, thank you. Yes. You grew up in the analog world. Yes. Computer came later, what type of photo work came later, white be? And how do you find that your analog affects you in very much like the kids who grew up in the different days and grew up in the same time? Well, um, from an educator, I mean, I look at that. There's two ways of answering that. One is from an artist, and one is from an educator. First, from an educator point of view, um, uh, and I think I probably shared this with some of the classes in the semester is that um, analog slows the process down. It's not as quick, and I find. That's a really good remedy to students. Quick pace digital. So it contradicts the digital age of rapidly shooting, instant gratification. Um, I'm kind of like in the, the, the anti 
that, whatever that is. So from an educator, I always found students who took the analog class first before they went into digital had a much better and stronger foundation because they had to learn everything in front of the camera and that relied so much in post-production. Now, I think in another 30, 40 years, it's probably going to be irrelevant. You know, I mean, I mean, oh, analog is now an alternative process. It's still going to be around. It's going to be very esoteric. You're just not going to see a lot of even universities probably have dark rooms in the future. You're going to, it's going to be very specialized, very secluded artists who want to del uh, die into that, dive into that, um, like they do in uh, dare daguerreotypes today. People still work in daguerreotypes. We don't teach it, but you can buy the materials for all this. So from an educator point of view, I think it's healthy to learn a foundation before you go into digital. It's difficult to, to tell that generally. There's always ex exceptions. It's difficult to tell that to the students today that the analog, learn that, you're gonna become a better digital photographer. Um, and I get it, you know, I, I'm, I try to put myself in the, in, I try to re live 19, 20 years, 21 years old, and try to think, okay, if I was in the students of today, I don't think I would be in analog. I think I see the resistance of going there. I mean, I, I quite honestly, I don't see that, even though I'm gonna still push it, you know, I'm gonna still kind of like talk them into it, you know, I think, Let's learn that, you know, a little bit. Let's get a let's get a taste for that. Now, from an artist point of view, um, I've gone. I'm now not really interested in digital anymore. I mean, I shoot. This was shot with a digital camera, but my photography now has yielded to hands-on mixed media, and uh, USF taught me it was a very uh, an interdisciplinary uh, college. So it embraced mixing mediums, all types of mediums together from the get-go. From the very get-go, you learn all different disciplines. And I think that that kind of education was useful um, and um, to embrace all different mediums to incorporate different materials together. And, um, and it, is, it just falls into I mean, finding stuff laying on the ground someplace. I mean, that kind of, that is so important to me to pick things up. And, and uh, I'll hold on to that thing knowing that someday it may have a, it may work. I rarely find a piece, oh, that's gonna fit into a piece now. No, it needs some time to, to um, ferment. <laughs> you know, it needs some time to develop a little bit. It will find its place, but it just needs some time. I can't force it. So it slows me down. It gives me time to think about it, digest it from an artist's point of view. Um, I don't think, I, I think that's hard to teach somebody. You have to kind of discover it on your own. I think from an artist's point of view, you can get a lot of information from your teachers and from years being around it. And then you have to let that, that information kind of sit with you. And you have to work with it. You, you, it's difficult or challenging, right, to, to take somebody else's experience and make it your own. You have to experience that on your own. And I think a lot of parents today, or a lot of educators, try, in my critical thinking here, try to maybe deliver information and make it theirs. And I think that is too much. I think you need to put it out there and let the student digest it on their terms in their timetable. More thoughts, comments, questions, anything. Wow. Um, I see. Well, I mean, um, um, I, I'm, you, know, you got me stumped here for a second because I have to think about some of these pieces came from Austin. Some of these pieces came from um, other parts of Florida. Some of them came from my backyard. There's, some of them came from model sets that my late father-in-law had. Um, 
Some of it is material that I bought at, um, oh, what's the, um, it's a, they sell, what is a, a franchise that sells material? Jo Joanne's or my, no, well, my, I bought material, tie dyed it, because I, I, I can't, I mean, and I just, and so, some of the materials I bought back in graduate school, back in the 80s. So my garage, I have compartmentalized all my kits. I'm a collector. I have so many things in my shelves that used to be inside, right? And, and now they're in my garage, which is fine. Um, and I save these things and then they're my Frobo's gifts to myself, right? So I go in, in and sometimes I have to go back and look at the things, what I have and go, right, I, I forgot I had this. So it's like a new discovery and that, that will fit. But um, I can say that, because um, um, I need to, um, I want to pick out something here that's really irrelevant and it's, and it's, it's challenging to kind of figure out where some of these pieces came because, well, I'll tell you something. I have quite a few toothpicks in there. Okay, toothpicks. And some other pieces I even have a lot more, but toothpicks, you know, people have asked me, why do you use toothpick? What? In the 60s, my dad had a toothpick in his mouth all the time. I mean, all the time. He was a smoker. When he didn't smoke, he had a toothpick. And he also, toothpicks, before they had dental floss, before they had pickers, you know, water pick, all that. People, and he was a farmer. And he used toothpicks to clean his teeth. Must work because he never had a cavity in his life. And he was dirt poor. He was dirt poor growing up. I mean, doesn't get much worse. So he had a toothpick, cheap. So I kind of, I don't, I never thought about it, but I like toothpicks. And I don't use toothpicks, but it's, it's kind of, so that is, that is a kind of a ancestral kind of component. I mean, if there's any other pieces here that I can, um, the, I don't want to walk out, the, the half arch blue dots, that came from a bathing suit of mine years ago. So it's some of the material patterns I keep where I rip things out of that, thinking, well, maybe there's a use for it. So um, most of it just scraps and I, I had to pin down where they came from. I mean, it's like, it's like something small that I picked up. I pick up a lot of things around my neighborhood. That's probably where a lot of things come from. I, and metal things, little metal objects in there. Um, oh, um, the purple oval shape at the bottom left, that purple bluish round thing at the bottom left. And I don't want to walk out of the necessary of the picture, but um, that is actually a face mask that I cut up. So, and it wasn't, it was, this was, I have to say that some people look at the trees in the playground and they go, because those are sand spurs in the trees. Those are the blooms of the trees, the sand spurs. And I've had a couple of people say to me, is this a, a, a COVID type of reaction? Because they kind of look like COVID, except they're green, not red, they're like the like the virus. And actually, the trees were made before I even knew what COVID meant. The trees were made back in 2015. I was just making things, and I feel like because I'll do that, I'll start something making things. I don't know where the, where it's going to go. And then it came when playground came to be in my mind. The trees, these trees would be part of playground. But I started that, this project, actually the, the front end of that was before COVID even came. So it has nothing to do with, with COVID. <laughs> so say that again, sir. There you go. Good, good. That's a good, that's a good point. Thank you. Some more thoughts, questions, anybody, anything. What are we doing on time? So it's one. I mean, I want you to have a chance to go look at the mixed media piece, right? Um, this is the photograph. And I can't say this. Listen, 
The photograph there, how I do this, is the mixed media piece, which is in the faculty show. I light it from the back before I settle it in the plexiglass box. I put a light in the background and take a photograph from the front. I have two lights. I have two soft boxes on each side. One was an incandescent light. One was a daylight. So that's why I get a little color shift in the front end. But all the colors in here are from the materials and what I painted on the piece. I didn't add any gels or acetates of color in the back. It is really what you see, how I photographed it. I will say this, I did add a little, bumped up a little saturation in Photoshop to compensate for the output. Because when you output your images, the gamut shrinks. So you have to compensate for how what, what colors and what contrast you lose when you output your images. Garbage in, garbage out. So you have to make up for some of that in the printing of the image. But the, actually, all the colors are exactly how they were shown. I have done other pieces where I've actually added some color acetates, which will be here next year. So I've added color to it to enhance the already existing color. But this actually was one of the few pieces that I didn't have to do anything about color. It was all embedded into the mixed media piece. I thank you very much for coming again. I appreciate it. Great questions.